Afia Espresso Talk Today community and Aquaba to the Espresso Talk Today show. It's Amma Robin here. I am the host of this great and groundbreaking podcast show. This is where we get curious and we stay courageous about any and all issues affecting Black people. The Espresso Talk Today podcast is a Black empowerment podcast show. We seek to empower ourselves and each other in every single show. The team has been discussing lots of issues and events about Black empowerment. Some of the issues are really obvious, others less so. But they are all super important to Black people and to the Black community. Empowerment never waits, so let's get started. Racism never sleeps, it never stops, and it never takes a break. And that's why empowerment is so, so, so important and why empowerment never sleeps, it never stops, and it never takes a break. This is a follow-up to the previous show where I discussed a racist encounter that I experienced a few years ago. Yes, it happened three years ago at a movie theater in Berkeley, California. I won't repeat all the details about the encounter. You can hear those on the previous show. But I'll just say briefly, a white man was sat in front of me and my family at a movie theater. He accused my son of kicking the back of his chair. My son, he's a teenager, had not done that, not even once. But the man kept accusing my son of kicking his chair. Then the man left to get the security guard to go kick us out of the movie. The security guard came back into the movie with him and demanded that we be kicked out, but the security guard refused. Then the man left and we stayed and watched the rest of the movie. There's a whole lot more to the story, but as I said, you can hear that in the previous podcast if you're interested. This is the short version, version and it is still difficult and emotional to remember this incident. There have been others since that time. As I said, racism never stops. But as I said last week, I still wake up at night thinking about how this could have ended differently. You might be thinking, look, nothing happened. Just let it go. I respond with, in fact, something did happen. The white man was aggressive, belligerent, and racist. He wanted us to face law enforcement and who knows what would have happened. But why didn't he get his way? Why weren't we kicked out of the movie theater or worse? This is where the secret weapon appears. The secret weapon saved us from the racist white accuser. The secret weapon saved us from the racist white system. Now, before I tell you what the secret weapon was, I will tell you what the secret weapon was not. It was not an AK-47 or any other type of firearm. I actually don't approve of those, those weapons. It was not a, a knife or any type of handheld weapon. It was not the management at the movie theater. It was not the white people sitting nearby who heard the encounter. It was not the press. And it was not the law or it was not societal rules. Can you guess what the secret weapon was? Have you guessed it yet? I'm going to tell you. The secret weapon that de-escalated the racist encounter that chose not to believe not to believe the racist white accuser that chose to believe in the non-guiltiness of my, my black family that refused to support white privilege was a black security guard a black security guard at the movie 
Before I go any further, I just want to thank that black security guard who helped us that night. A sante sonnet to him. I wish that I knew his name, but all that I can do right now is to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and again thank you for doing your job and protecting my family. Every movie theater has a security guard. The racist white accuser was depending on the security guard and the whole white supremacist system to get us kicked out of the movie theater or perhaps even get us arrested or to end up like lots of other black people in police custody, like our sister Sandra Bland, like our brother Eric Gardner, like our brother Michael Brown, and too many other brothers and sisters to name. This is what the white, white accuser was hoping for and counting on. He was not going to count, he was not counting on our secret weapon. He wasn't counting on a woke black security guard who would do his job and let us watch the movie and go home alive and well and safe. This is not how the system was designed to work. And in many cases, it does not work this way. It was designed to support and believe the racist white accuser. It was not designed for us innocent or not guilty black people to win the dispute. Statistic wise, we got lucky. The odds were against us getting a black security guard. According to the census, 55% of unarmed security guards in America are white. Only 15% of unarmed security guards are African American and 17% are Latino. Perhaps you're asking now, but wouldn't the white security guard have done the same thing? Great question. My answer, maybe. But I haven't had great experiences with white security guards. Thinking that and knowing that many security guards are actually off-duty police officers could explain it. I've discussed with Espresso Talk Today listeners that I have had bad experiences with white security guards and police. I've been followed in stores, not once, not twice, but many times. I've been searched by white security officers as I was leaving the store. Not a lot of times, but enough times that make me adjust my behavior. I don't steal, I don't steal anything, but I always take and keep receipts after I buy something. I always keep my hands out of my pockets, especially as I'm leaving the store. I always walk through the scanner, even if I haven't bought anything. This is because I'm often being watched by security guards who are white. I even had an experience in which my son, my teenage son again, and I were visiting colleges. This was at USC. He asked an armed white security guard for directions to the cafeteria. Now why he did that, I don't know, but that's for another issue. That security guard put his hand on his gun as my son approached him, then told him to get back and go away. And he didn't say this nicely. Saying all of this while having his hand on his gun, that encounter, that still brings up traumatic emotions for me. So is it reasonable for me to think that a white security guard in a movie theater would have believed me over the white racist accuser? In fact, I believe that a white security guard would have questioned us, scolded us, or threatened us, and possibly even kicked us out of the movie. He might even have called the police on us because of the accusation by another white person. Fortunately, though, we're coming back to my secret weapon. Fortunately, though, the secret weapon saved us, and I am so grateful. But as I say this, I also hear my great-grandmother's words, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And I know that you know what this means. We cannot trust every black person just because they are black. 
Perhaps this applies to white people too. You cannot distrust every white person just because they're white, and that's true. But it's different with white people in security or in law enforcement. I won't go into that right now. You can challenge me on it later, send me a message, we can talk about it. What do I mean when I say that all black security guards or police cannot be trusted? They all will not behave as a secret weapon against racism or racist white accusers. I'm sorry to say this, but I have seen examples of black security guards and black police supporting the white supremacist system and hurting other black folks. This goes all the way back to slavery, but there are recent examples too. Remember, remember the five black police officers who killed 29-year-old Tyree Nichols? I do, and I'll never forget how they attacked and viciously beat young and innocent Tyree Nichols to death. They were part of that Scorpion unit that had been terrorizing the black community in Memphis for years. Tyree wasn't the first brother or sister that had been attacked, and they had all been getting away with this. They expected, those black police officers expected to get away with it again. They expected their black police chief, C.J. Davis, C.J. Davis, to look the other way again. Yes, C. Chief Davis, the first black woman to serve in that position in Memphis, knew how that renegade group had been terrorizing black neighborhoods. Actually, she had launched the Scorpion unit herself And that's a Scorpion unit that's been accused of using extreme intimidation, that's in quotes, humiliation, in quotes, and violence, in quotes, again, that had disproportionately focused on and targeted young black men. But she had not stopped them. She had not protected black communities that had been, that she had been charged with protecting. Another example? A black police officer responding to a domestic violence incident shot and wounded the 11-year-old black kid who had made the 911 call for help. Yes, it might have been an accident, but he was an experienced police officer. He was in the home of black people, and I think he knew that whoever he fired at coming from around the corner would most likely be a black person. With this perspective, with this in mind, he probably knew that he did not have to use a high standard of care or safety in that black home. And I believe that he fired recklessly. Would he have done, would he have acted in the same way in a white home? I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. James Baldwin once wrote, this is in quotes, we used to say, If you must call a policeman, for we hardly ever did, for God's sake, try to make sure it's a white one. I mean, what does that say to us? So yes, there have been cases when a black security guard or black police officer had not been my secret weapon, but instead they've been the secret weapon of white supremacy, really actually created by white supremacy. And there does not need to be a white person in the room for white supremacy to function. That's the way it's supposed to function. So what's with these armed black security officers hurting black folks? There's a lot to unpack there, but I won't go into all of it. I will just say that I believe there is a mindset of racism and anti-blackness in police and and security culture. It is a closed and hierarchical community that encourages the mistreatment and the dehumanization of black people. Anyone acting with that anti-black mindset gets rewarded by the others and by the system. Another thought is, and this is a complicated one, although the other one is too, but this is complicated internalized racism. And now just hear me out on this one. 
You know, we've mentioned internalized racism briefly on this podcast show, but definitely not enough. (laughs) It's too much for today's show, but I promise we're going to get back and discuss internalized racism on another show. And we might even bring in some experts and get real with it. Internalized racism is the result of living as a marginalized person or minority in a structurally racist society. It's what happens when black people are living in a white racist society. It happens to black people living in a white racist society. Not to everyone, but to many. And I think that we all, all black people, actually do have it to some degree, but some have it definitely more than others. But in a society, we are spoon-fed anti-black racism from get, and we accept it. We see it in the media. We see it in schools. We see teachers treating black kids differently. We see black people on television or in the media being portrayed as violent, ignorant, or dangerous. We're told that black is ugly and white is beautiful. We're told that black people are unhealthy, ignorant, lazy, and poor, and that it's our own fault. We hear and see these things so often that we start to accept them. And we start to believe them about other people and about ourselves. And this causes us to act and treat other black people in a particular way. In this particular way we're talking about, we think of ourselves in a particular way, and it's all consistent with the white supremacist way of thinking. As Carter G. Woodson said in The Miseducation of the Negro, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. He's going to act in a way consistent with his thinking. That last part was mine. And that, to man and woman, okay, and that is why... You don't need a white person in the room for white supremacy to function. Honestly, I see this a lot. I see it in other black people. I see it in myself. I have to watch myself, my behavior, and my language very closely. But many black people, particularly black police or black people working in security, don't fight the racist messages that they're being spoon-fed. They act in a way that rewards them for their internalized racism. Oh yeah, I have seen so much that I could say about internalized racism and so many people, I have so many people I could discuss, but again, that's for another show. I just wanted to introduce this about internalized racism. But I will say that my secret weapon, back to my secret weapon, because that's really what this story is about, was a woke black security guard And I know that wokeness is under attack right now. But wokeness is important for black people. Of course, Ron DeSantis is attacking wokeness. So of course he is. And so is Trump. And so are the other far right wing, you know, weirdos. But they have their reasons. Because they don't want black people helping each other, supporting each other, or recognizing racism or racist thinking or racist laws or racist policies. They would not have wanted the security guard to help me, even though I wasn't doing anything wrong. They would have wanted the guard to support the white accuser. And that's what really frustrates them about wokeness. The woke black security guard helped me, helped another black person. And again, I really do thank him a lot because everything was working for him not to. Okay, I want to finish this uncommon monologue, and maybe that's what it is, by considering a few thoughts and actions that can help to fight racist white accusers weaponizing the system against us. First, I always say that it's we have to start with awareness. Be aware of the situation. Remember that this person is a racist accuser, white accuser using the system as a weapon against you. 
But this knowledge empowers you to react and to respond with power and to understand that your freedom and safety might be at risk. Second, look for help from your community. Consider if there are people around you who can help you in the situation. Perhaps there is a woke security guard or a kind store manager or a friend or another person around who can help you. Perhaps there is someone who can be an ally to you. No one needs to confront the accuser directly. The best thing is to try to distract them from their behavior. Ignore the accuser altogether and talk to someone who seems helpful. Mention a neutral topic like the, we like the weather. And third, if there is no other help around you, then decide if you want to engage your fight or your flight response. With your awareness of the imbalanced situation, you need to take special precautions. Document the situation. Use your phone to record the encounter. Call someone on the phone or text them to let them know what's happening as it is happening. That's important. Let the accuser see that you are documenting everything. You can also choose flight, or a better word is to diffuse the situation. You can leave or walk, not run, but walk away. In my movie situation, my son moved to seat, but the accuser continued anyway. In that situation, we decided to stay and fight. Fortunately, the woke black security guard helped us. So this brings up another topic. Sometimes we see other black people in this situation of facing a white accuser. The white accuser seems and acts like they have all the power in the world. It can be a frightening situation. You might want to consider intervening on someone else's behalf. There are steps that you can take to intervene safely. I'll, I'm going to do a full show on this later, but I will mention one thing. Distraction. Now, never confront the accuser, as I said. Go to the, I don't have a better word, so I'm going to say victim, in quotes, and distract them with conversation about a neutral subject like the weather or anything to something neutral. Do not address or acknowledge the accuser in any way. Focus all of your energy on the, in quotes, victim. You can also tell the victim that you're recording and documenting the situation. Tell them loudly, I am recording this situation. I'm documenting this. Hold up your phone camera and make it clear that you are documenting everything. Never look at the accuser. Never acknowledge them in any way. Bystander intervention is very, very helpful. And as I said, we're going to have a show on this later. So we can go into this much deeper. On a bigger note, we need more woke or socially conscious black security guards and police officers and community support officers. We need more black prosecutors and district attorneys. We need more black people in leadership and decision-making positions in the criminal justice system. Actually, we need more black people in all areas and all levels of the political and economic system too. But again, another show. We need more black faces in the right places, but not just black faces. Black faces who are woke, socially conscious, and having the courage and willingness to help black people. We need more black police officers who will give a second chance and guidance to a black teen who might be getting into trouble. We need more black police officers who will gently and respectfully help a black person having a mental health crisis. Instead of shooting them or tasering them to death, we need people who are going to intervene safely. And actually, we need black community support people to help black people having a mental health crisis or who are involved in a domestic dispute or domestic problem. We need black people in security and law enforcement who will treat black people with humanity and fight white security and law enforcement officers 
who abuse black people and who abuse anyone else. We need more black security and police officers who will help us, but they better stay woke and they better do their job. They better reject the anti-black culture in law enforcement. They better fight against anti-black culture and behavior in law enforcement. They need to bring a culture of true protection and service to our community. Finally, I just cannot fail to mention that these are all band-aid and temporary measures. They're effective, but we need to think be out of the box here. I'm with Angela Davis here, who says that we need a completely new system. That's a revolution, not reform, not reform. Defunding the police, building up communities, eliminating prisons, putting money and resources into supporting communities. You know, I have lots to say about this, but not today because I'm actually done for today. I'm not finished talking about this subject of fighting racial justice and, and against white racism and privilege. But I do want to expand on the discussion about bystander intervention and about complete, not complete police reform, but police revolution. We are all bystanders at some time and I often feel helpless, but we're not. Look for a discussion on bystander intervention soon. Yes, we've talked about a lot today. And some of this information can bring about painful memories and difficult emotions. Those emotions, those memories are real. Please take them seriously. You do matter and your feelings matter. After this show, take a few minutes to sit quietly and breathe. Sit with your feelings. Sit with your breath. You're not alone. Asante Sana to the security guard, the black man working at the movie theater who helped me and my family during the encounter with the racist white accuser. You were my secret weapon and my savior for the day. Asante Sana to you, my community, for showing up and staying with us. We appreciate you and your presence and your continued support. You really are the reason that we do what we do every single day. And you can join us every day to discuss these issues on Instagram at Ama Robin L. Those are underscores, Ama underscore Robin underscore the letter L. Check out my profile. Leave your questions, comments, reflections, and just anything you want to say. I want to hear from you, and I'm here for you. If you think other people will be interested in this Black Empowerment Podcast show, then please, by all means, send it to them. We got to start talking about these issues, and we got to keep talking about them. As I said in the beginning, racism never stops, so neither can we. But we can also celebrate our culture, our community, and our connection. These are more powerful. And I always remember that love is more powerful than hate. And if you want to keep discussing or just reading about these issues, then you should definitely subscribe to my weekly newsletter, The Nomo Beat. We discuss lots of different issues there. You can get your date, your weekly dose of black empowerment. It's never a dull moment, but there are lots of growth moments. You can subscribe at the Espresso Talk Today website, espressotalktoday.com, or on Instagram, again, at Ama Robin L on my profile page. I'm Ama Robin for Espresso Talk Today. And remember, now more than ever, strength, soul, and reparations. Believe Black people. Ashe community.